Yes. Okay, Santanda, go ahead. Yeah. Dustin, you are going to start. Uh, good morning from uh, India. I, Santanu Gunwa, convener of this virtual workshop. Gladly welcome each and everyone to our today's session. We are fortunate to have with us Dr. Justin Rubinstein from US Geological Survey as a keynote speaker. He's regarded as one of the uh, pioneers in, in this seismology. To conduct this seminar, uh, we have with us Professor J.R. Kyle as a session chairperson, Dr. Devasit Hazorika from Wadia Institute of Human and Geology as a session co-chairperson, and Dr. Sukanta Roy, Honorable Director of BGRL, Ministry of Arts Science, Government of India, as a special guest. So my uh, now, now may I request our session chairperson, Professor J.R. Kyle, uh, to say a few words about the Professor J.R. Kyle. Maybe you can take a quick remarks from our session course chairperson, Dr. Deposit Hazorika. About Dr. Deposit Hazorika. Uh, good morning uh, to all of uh, all of you. Uh, good morning, Dr. Justin Rubinstein uh, from USGS USA. And on behalf of the organizing committee, uh, I would like to welcome you uh, to this third international virtual workshop on the global seismology and tectonics. Uh, 2022. Uh, we are uh, eagerly waiting for your interesting topic on the earthquakes in the uh, heartland. How energy, uh, how energy production causes earthquakes in the unexpected places. So, uh, being a uh, people from uh, residing in the seismically active zone, we are very much interested to listen to your talk and. Uh, I request you to start your lecture, and before that, I would like to uh, hand over it to our anchor, today's anchor, to start with. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adarika. Now, may I request our session chairperson, Professor J.R. Kyle, to say a few words about Professor J.R. Kyle. So, please unmute yourself. Sir, please unmute. Sorry about that. <laughs> good morning and good evening to all participants and good evening to Justin. And we are all so glad to have you here to in, play in today's uh, workshop. Uh, we all you know, look forward to hearing to your uh, lecture on the architects because, because this is a new field for us. Uh, in a sense that uh, in terms of energy and the earthquakes, I think you have you have got a very good topic and we are all uh, looking forward to listen to you. Thank you so much. Over to Ankar. Thank you so much, sir. Now, before Justin starts his talk, may I request Dr. Timangsu Sitia, uh, CSI and NEST Zorat, to read out his biodata. About to Dr. Bortak, Dr. Uh, Setia. Uh, am I audible? Yes, very much. Yeah. Uh, namaste. A very warm good morning to one and all from Assam, the Sentinel of Northeast India. It's my privilege, and I take this opportunity to read out the brief biodata of Dr. Justin Rubinstein. Dr. Justin Rubinstein is a research geophysicist and deputy chief of United States Geological Survey, USGS, induced seismicity project. Rubinstein received his bachelor's degree from University of California, Los Angeles, and his master's and doctorate from Stanford University. His current research is focused on the following aspects of induced earthquakes, observation and physical interpretation of induced earthquakes, computing earthquake hazard for induced earthquakes, ground motion in induced earthquakes. Besides, earthquake recurrence and prediction, earthquake location method, repeating earthquakes, time-dependent earth properties, tectonic tremor, nonlinear site response. Dr. Rubinstein's work has been published in reputed journals like Nature and Science. He has published more than hundreds of papers in reputed journals, conferences, and seminars. This is just epigrammatic, wide of his research and knowledge vocation. 
Thank you, Dr. Rubinstein. And now moving forward with eagerness to hear your talk. Dr. Rubinstein, kindly over to you for your talk. OK, uh, thank you. Thank you all for that kind introduction and the, the opportunity to uh, present this topic to you. Um, so let's I will share my slides. Is that working? Yes, uh, yes, yes, it's yes, it's yes. working. Uh, okay, fantastic. Uh, so today what I'll be talking about is induced seismicity. So seismicity caused by, by human activities. And the title is Earthquakes in the Heartland. And what I mean by the heartland is is earthquakes in the in the central part of the United States, uh, and this is part of a stable stable continent. And so we really don't traditionally have a whole lot of earthquakes there, yet we've uh, seen a, a whole lot of seismicity there in the past dozen or so years. Now um, I'm going to be focusing primarily here in in the United States, but obviously induced seismicity is a problem uh, globally, and I will touch. Uh, on a couple of areas of induced seismicity outside the United States, but uh, to some degree, uh, the the dramatic rise in seismicity in the United States really is what brought uh, the the seismology world's attention back to induced seismicity, despite the fact it is actually a a rather old topic. Uh, so what I have here is just a, is a is a couple of graphics. On on the left hand side, you can see. Um, a, a plot showing the count of magnitude three and larger earthquakes in the central United States that suddenly increases in 2009 or so. And in the background, it's just a is an oil and gas pump jack. And the, the, the idea is that this is showing a relation between the two. And and a right is is a is a Photoshop of, of a map of Oklahoma. This is this white thing is the, the shape of the state of Oklahoma. And it says, welcome to Oklahoma, home of the quake NATO. People generally think of Oklahoma, when they think of Oklahoma, they think of tornadoes, but uh, in the past 10 or 15 years, people now start thinking of earthquakes there as well. So induced earthquakes uh, really actually aren't, aren't that new of a topic. Humans have been causing earthquakes since, uh, at least since the late 1800s. And I wanna first just be, be clear with some terminology. When I say earthquake was induced, I mean, an, the earthquake was caused by human activity. I may sometimes say it was triggered, but I, I use these terms interchangeably. And so the, the first known induced earthquakes occurred uh, in 1894, and they were felt in, in the city of Johannesburg, South Africa. And what they were doing there is they were mining for gold using room and pillar mining. So what you might imagine a, a parking structure, a tall parking structure looks like you just have these very tall pillars and you excavate the room. And what, what actually wound up happening is they started having earthquakes uh, due to the fact that they've excavated so much and collapses within those mines. And the shaking was strong enough to be felt at the surface in the city of Johannesburg. So these are the first uh, known human induced earthquakes. Um, but not long after, hold on. Not long after, um, a seismological laboratory was founded in Bochum, Germany to start studying uh, induced earthquakes, uh, earthquakes induced by coal, coal mining in Germany. And just a dozen years later, the first seismic monitoring network was actually installed with the specific purpose of monitoring induced earthquakes. And that was in the Silesia coal basin in, in Poland. So, so the first way humans were causing earthquakes was through mining activities. Now, the next observation or new kind of, of human induced earthquakes that were observed were related to oil and gas extraction. So this is a photo of Goose Creek, Texas in the 1930s, actually. And you can see that there's just oil derricks as far as the eye can see. And what was actually happening is by extracting so much oil and gas, you started uh, relieving stresses on, on lower uh, on faults below this area and started causing earthquakes about up to magnitude four. And, and to our knowledge, these are the only earthquakes to, that have been felt in the city of Houston uh, in history. 
And the last type of sort of historic induced seismicity that we've seen is uh, reservoir induced seismicity. Um, and this is a photo of Lake Mead. These are the first, this is the location of the first known in, induced earthquakes caused by reservoirs. Uh, and here you can see the reservoirs is actually quite low recently. But basically by filling a reservoir, you've added a whole lot of fluid uh, into a region, and so that is going to add stress on default, but also offer the, offer the opportunity for fluids to go down into faults and, and in a way lubricate these faults, making them more likely to fail. And so these are just a couple of historical examples uh, of induced seismicity and a few different ways human activities can cause earthquakes. So, so how do we define uh, when an earthquake is induced or how, how do we figure out if an earthquake is induced? And when I start thinking about these, I, I start asking myself three different questions. You know, is, is there a human activity that is close in space to where those earthquakes are occurring? Is there, you know, are these earthquakes occurring close in time to, to some activities? So did, did earthquakes happen shortly after say, uh, uh, so a well was hydraulically fractured, for example? Or are the earthquakes close to the surface? As you might expect, human activities are going to be at or very close to the surface. So any stresses that human activity is causing is going to be largest close to the surface, close to those activities. And so these are the, sort of the things that, that I start thinking about uh, when I, I start looking at, at earthquakes that might be suspect. And unfortunately, these, these are not hard and fast rules. I can come up with a number of examples uh, of earthquake sequences that violate one of these rules, and I could come up with with an earthquake sequence that actually violates all three of these rules. So these are these are good things to think about, but they aren't it, it, they aren't cut and dry. But but so we still have the question of why is why is there this sudden uh, attention to induce seismicity uh, in the past ten or fifteen years? And and I think this plot really demonstrates this quite clearly. So again, we're looking at a count of magnitude three earthquakes by year here in the central United States, going back to the 1970s. And you can see it, it's on average about 20 or 30 magnitude three earthquakes per year. And I'm using magnitude three and larger just because we're confident that we have recorded all of these earthquakes uh, of this size or larger going back to 1970. And then you can see in 2009, the earthquake rate starts to increase, peaking at over 1,000 magnitude threes in 2015, dropping down to under 200 in 2019, but things have started ramping back up. And this is 2022 as of uh, a few months ago, and so it's actually a little bit higher. But there's another thing, there's a few other things. Let's let's look at these, break these apart. So now we're looking at 1973 to 2008, so 36 years. And you can see the seismicity is more or less scattershot across the United States. It's pretty evenly distributed. You can see that there's a, a dense area of seismicity here. This is a known area of seismicity. This is where the New Madrid seismic zone is. It's produced uh, multiple magnitude eights in the early 1800s as well as the Eastern Tennessee shear zone. So these are areas of known natural seismicity, but otherwise there's just sort of scattered uh, seismicity everywhere. And you can see there's 850 magnitude threes in this 36 year period, averaging at, at 24 per year. And if you look at just the last 13 or 14 years, you can see this looks very different, despite the fact that we have five times as many earthquakes on this figure, it actually looks like there's less. And that's just because the earthquakes are so densely packed, in particular here in Oklahoma and Kansas. And this is an average of 300 earthquakes per year. And as I, as I noted, there are some years that had even more, far more than that, 1,000 magnitude threes in 2015. And so the earthquake rate has changed, but also the distribution of seismicity has changed. And, and the, the, the best way that I can really demonstrate this is looking at a cumulative count of magnitude three earthquakes in the United States. And so you can see, you know, if, if the earthquake rate is constant, we'd expect this to more or less be a line, just in that you have 10 earthquakes a year, it's just going to sum up evenly. And you can see that this is pretty linear until about 2010. Things really pick up in about 2015 or so. And, and you have a big, huge increase in seismicity that sort of flattens out and then goes back up in 2021 or so. 
And so what we're going to do is subtract out areas that we have known induced earthquakes. And so as I pointed out, Oklahoma is the area with, with the biggest bump in seismicity. So let's subtract that out. And you can see we've almost flattened out this line already just by removing earthquakes in Oklahoma that we know are induced. And, and what, what we're really trying to do is get back to this background if we eliminate all of the induced earthquakes. So next we'll re, uh, remove this area, which is the Raton Basin, another area of known induced seismicity. You can see it sort of lowers this as well. We can subtract out the Guy Greenbrier earthquake sequence and that flattens things out even further. And then we can subtract out a number of different induced earthquake sequences in Texas, and we're pretty much back to a flat line once again. And so this is really showing us that the natural seismicity, because these are all areas of known induced seismicity, the natural seismicity rate in the central US has not changed. We've just got these areas where seismicity is dramatically higher. And I do want to point out this area in particular, in addition to Oklahoma, we'll be focusing on this area. And this is what's known as the Permian Basin. And the Permian Basin is an area that has really seen accelerated growth in the, in the past two or three years of, of both oil and gas production, but also earthquakes. Because you can see, if you're looking at the very right-hand edge of this count of earthquakes, you see this big kink in all of these, and it's removed when we subtract out Texas. And just to, to show you how big a deal Oklahoma is, I wanted to show the count of number of, of magnitude three earthquakes in California versus Oklahoma. Now, traditionally, we think of California as the, the second most seismogenic state in the United States after Alaska. Very lots of lots and lots of earthquakes there. Um, and compare it to Oklahoma. And if we go back to 2000, Oklahoma is pretty much flat. But for the years 2014 through uh, 2017, the earthquake rate exceeded and at times, you know, you know, vastly exceeded the earthquake rate in Oklahoma or in, in California, but it's dropped way back down. In fact, uh, this year they've only had seven magnitude threes so far, uh, three quarters of the way through the year. Uh, and that's compared to over 900 in 2015. So things have dramatically changed. But as I mentioned, let's let's bring in the Permian Basin which is pretty much at you know zero or one earthquakes per year, but all of a sudden the earthquake rate has been rising in the last few years. And right now the, the projection for 2022 is that the Permian Basin may actually have more earthquakes than California. And so this is this is really showing us that, that the seismicity rate is, is picking up now and becoming quite significant in the Permian Basin. Now, I, I mentioned, you know, I've been really talking about magnitude threes and focusing on magnitude threes, and that's really just from a statistics perspective. You know, are, are we seeing bigger earthquakes? And the answer is yes. Uh, here's, here's just a couple of photos of, of damage from earthquakes here in the United States. Uh, a 2011 earthquake near uh, Trinidad, Colorado that caused some damage. Uh, another photo from a, an earthquake a couple of months later uh, near Prague, Oklahoma again caused some damage. Fortunately, uh, in the United States, we've not seen any fatalities related to induced earthquakes as of yet. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case everywhere. Uh, in China, they had a magnitude 5.2 that was induced by hydraulic fracturing in 2018, and that killed 17 people. And it isn't the only earthquake related to hydraulic fracturing that has killed people in China. So. So induced earthquakes are actually having very significant consequences. Um, and just another example uh, of, of an induced earthquake that caused a, a fair amount of damage was the, the Pohong earthquake, which I believe was 2018 uh, here in southern South Korea. This was a, a geothermal stimulation, and, and I won't really be spending much time talking about geothermal stimulation, but this is another way that, that human activities can, can cause earthquake and uh, 82 people were injured, including 15 people who had to go to the hospital. So, so these moderate earthquakes are really uh, a big deal and it is something to be concerned about. And you know, that there's just because we haven't seen a magnitude six or seven in the past uh, 10 or 15 years doesn't mean that they could not happen in the future. And this is just uh, in, in Oklahoma, for example, we, we saw three magnitude fives 
uh, within just one year spread across the state. Uh, again, we're very fortunate here in the United States in that th these earthquakes are really occurring in, in areas with, without dense population. These are relatively rural areas, and so as a result, the, the density of, of, of population is quite low. But I want to draw your attention to uh, this Cushing earthquake. It was only a magnitude 5 earthquake, but it actually caused the most damage uh, because it occurred more or less in the middle of a, of a, of a town of, of 3,000 people. Um, and so again, it's not just size, but it's also location of the earthquakes that's very important. And Cushing is, is also particularly important because it has an incredibly high earthquake risk. It's known as the pipeline crossroads of the world. There are nine major oil and gas pipelines that pass through this area, and there is a whole lot of, of storage of U.S. crude oil. So these, these sort of uh, circular rings that you see here in the upper right, those are giant oil storage tanks. Uh, they're about 100 meters across. They are gigantic. And this is just a Google Earth image that you can see here. And you can see that these storage tanks are just all over. There is so much oil there. Approximately 60 million barrels are stored there at any one time. And uh, from 2014 to 2016, they saw six magnitude fours, including a magnitude five. And you can only imagine if, if just one of these ruptured the, the level of in, environmental destruction that could occur uh, with the failure of just even one of these, much less uh, multiple uh, ones of these storage tanks. So I now wanna, wanna show a video that, that I think is, is really cool. And what they've done is they've animated the seismicity in Oklahoma, and it's gonna start out slow. Uh, and they've also added sound to for each of the earthquakes. And it'll start slow, but by the end, you'll really start to hear how dramatically the earthquake rate has changed. So I think that that really dramatically shows you how, how much the earthquake rate uh, really changed in Oklahoma. Um, and obviously the earthquake rate in Oklahoma has, has now dropped back down. So it's it's nearly back at the background earthquake rate. But um, you know, this this was this was the, the reality of people in the state of Oklahoma for a number of years. Now, one question that that we probably should answer is is how are we having these earthquakes in, in the middle of a continent you know in an area that is a seismic are there even faults and and the short answer is yes so this is this is a, a fault map that was put to have put together by the oklahoma geological survey uh in collaboration with a number of the oil and gas producers in in the area and you can see that the the state is just completely littered with faults. And this is something that, that we as, as our scientists sort of know in the back of our heads, but perhaps don't always uh, keep in mind is that there are faults basically everywhere. They might just not necessarily be active. So let's, let's walk through uh, a number of different kinds of, of oil and gas operations. Uh, there's somebody with their mic on. Could somebody mute that, please? Thank you. Oh. So there's a number of different kinds of oil and gas operations that can cause uh, earthquakes, and I just want to walk through them. And we're really going to focus on hydraulic fracturing and wastewater disposal. But uh, we'll, we'll walk through these, these rather quickly. So here's, here's an example of a hydraulic fracturing site. It's an incredibly complex operation. There's, I've been to a number of these. There's hoses and pipes going everywhere, and they're injecting large volumes of fluid. And the biggest earthquake was the magnitude 5.2 in China that I mentioned earlier. Um, there have been multiple magnitude sevens or so that occurred in the 1970s and 80s in Uzbekistan that were related to oil production, so the actual extraction 
of, of oil. Unfortunately, uh, there isn't a lot of information about these earthquakes because uh, the Soviet Union was pretty closed at the time. And so there's not a lot of information about what actually occurred in this earthquake sequence. Um, the next kind of, of operation that, that can cause earthquakes is what's known as wastewater disposal. And we'll walk through this a little bit. This is uh, uh, an example of a wastewater disposal well that I visited in Colorado. It doesn't look like a very impressive operation, but they are injecting very large volumes of water deep underground. And this can cause earthquakes. The biggest we've seen so far is a magnitude 5.8. And the last example uh, is, is what's known as enhanced oil recovery. This is a system, again, where you're injecting fluids underground, uh, but in, instead of trying to dispose, you're injecting into your production formation with the intention of keeping the fluid pressure within your reservoir high so that you can continue extracting oil from another part of the reservoir. And the biggest earthquake that we've seen uh, related to enhanced oil recovery or second re secondary recovery is a magnitude four and a half. So how, how is it that these operations are causing earthquakes? We're either injecting fluid or extracting fluid. Um, so let's let's actually look at, at this sort of right hand side first. Um, if the, the sort of first way that you can cause things is through changes in solid stress, either you're adding weight or removing weight. And so that can change the stresses on a fault that's nearby. You can make it less or potentially more likely to slip given this change in mass. But the other way that, that sort of this change in volume, this change in mass can induce earthquakes is through what's known as poor elastic effect. So basically by adding this fluid, you've increased this weight and you're causing the pore space. If you've added fluid, you're causing the pore space to actually be stressed and to start closing. And so that's going to increase your stresses a little bit that way, just through the closure or the compression of these pores. Or if you've extracted fluid, it's going to, to decrease due to the expansion of this pore space. Now, the other way in what we, what, the way we think most of these earthquakes are being induced is, is the fluid pressure effect. So basically, if you're injecting fluid into a well, you're trying to inject it into a reservoir that, that it will just take it and that it isn't going to uh, have, have a whole lot of response to it. And most of the time, you inject into that reservoir and nothing ever happens. But on occasion, these reservoirs are connected to a fault. And so when you've injected fluid into this reservoir, it finds its way to, it finds its way to the fault. And more specifically, the fluid pressure finds its way into the fault. And so once you've raised fluid pressure within your fault, you've just de decreased the effective normal stress in this fault. And so by de decreasing the effective normal stress, you've decreased the amount of frictional resistance to slip. And so if you decrease the frictional resistance to slip, you've made it more likely for an earthquake to occur. And so this is what we think is actually happening uh, most of the time. So let's let's just walk through an animation that sort of shows how ejection cause, causes earthquakes. So here's our well here. It's been drilled down. We're injecting fluids into this reservoir here. This reservoir is, is simply intended to be uh, a reservoir that, that will hold the water. We've got a fault right here that's being compressed with normal stresses, but fluid in the fluid pressure is going to start going into it and it's going to start sort of relieving the pressure that's holding that fault closed. And as you continue reducing your normal stress, eventually the, the reduction in the friction will result in an earthquake, which we should see just here. So next, let's talk about hydraulic fracturing. Now, hydraulic fracturing uh, is actually, again, a, a rather old technology. It was uh, invented 75 years ago in the Huguenot field in, in Kansas. And it is uh, by intention making earthquakes. Uh, you trying to make very small earthquakes on the order of minus, magnitude minus two to maybe magnitude one. And it's simply the, the high pressure injection of water uh, to increase permeability. It's very short duration. Uh, its injection is for hours or maybe a few days. And any individual well, you might see 100,000 barrels per well. Um, and then after that, the well goes into production. So you don't have a hydraulic fracturing well, you have a what's known as a production well, but you have 
refract it so you can extract more easily. And so this is just a very simple cartoon showing the intention of hydraulic fracturing. And so you can, if you look at this cartoon, you can see you're only able to access sort of the, the areas that have been shaded of where oil is. But once we've fractured the rock and created connectivity to many of these areas, you're able to access far more oil. And so that's really the intention of hydraulic fracturing. So the other main thing that we've been thinking about when it comes to induced earthquakes is wastewater disposal. But, but before we explain what wastewater disposal is, we need to answer the question, what is wastewater? And the main component of wastewater, at least in the United States, is what's known as co-produced water. And this is going to be happening in all wells, whether or not they've been fracked or not. And co-produced water is simply uh, water that's trapped in the same formation, salt water specifically, that's trapped in the same formation as the oil and gas. Now, as we all recall, oil is just the decomposed biological components within relict oceans. And so you're going to wind up having salty water in the same location. So when you extract oil, you get salt water too. It's just not an option. And so this is, this is the main source of wastewater in the United States. And there are some areas um, where the ratio of, of salt water to oil is about 20 to one. You're producing tons and tons of, of this salt water. So this is the main source of co-produced water, uh, of, of water that is injected, but we also have spent frac fluids. Basically, all the water that we've injected to create this fracture, these fractures, then gets uh, extracted out. And if it cannot be reused, it needs to be disposed of. And so wastewater disposal is just the drilling of a well into a permeable formation where we can inject fluid and basically hope that it that it goes away and we never deal with it again. You're intentionally injecting into porous formations. You're going to be injecting for years. Some of these wells in inject uh, a million barrels a month, two million barrels a month, three million barrels a month. Oh, and I should clarify, there are about six barrels in a cubic meter. So, so you might be looking at, at you know, half, half a million uh, cubic meters are being injected in just one well. In the United States, we have about 35,000 of these wastewater disposal wells, and, and in general, very few are actually connected to felt earthquakes. So I just want to show you an example of seismicity in Oklahoma and, and show you the relationship between hydraulic fracturing and wastewater disposal. And, you'll, and we can do a, a brief thought experiment on which we think is more likely to cause earthquakes. So in the upper panel shown in the, the histogram is showing you uh, frac jobs and then shown in black is the earthquake rate in the state. And you can see that they, they really don't have a, a lot to do with each other. The earthquakes appear to lag hydraulic fracturing by you know, a year or two, uh, which is a nice correlation. But since hydraulic fracturing takes a few days, we wouldn't expect there to be such a lag. So the, so the, the, the connection between most of the seismicity, there, there is clearly no connection between most of the seismicity and fracking, at least in the state of Oklahoma. Whereas if we look at wastewater disposal, the story is, is rather different. You can see that the wastewater disposal rate is, is rising, 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 and it takes a long time. But when you reach sort of a threshold, you start seeing uh, lots of seismicity. And again, there is a little bit of a lag uh, between injection and the seismicity, but that actually that makes a fair amount of sense just in that uh, the injection from wastewater disposal goes on for very, very long periods of time. And so let's let's think about this and and what we will come to is this actually makes sense that wastewater disposal is going to be more, most much more likely to cause earthquakes. Hydraulic fracturing is generally very brief and it's very low volume, well, at least with respect to wastewater disposal. And so this means you're going to be affecting a smaller area because it's a low volume, and you're going to be affecting that area for a small amount of time. So you don't have a large window of opportunity to induce earthquakes. Whereas with wastewater disposal, you're injecting incredibly large volumes of fluids. So you're gonna affect a large area and you're injecting over years or even decades 
And so you're going to be affecting this area for, for a long period of time. And so you're, this, it stands to reason that you're much more likely to induce wastewater earthquakes with wastewater disposal. So if so, let's let's now go back to the question. You know, we we why all of a sudden are we seeing all of these new earthquakes? If um, you know, if, if hydraulic fracturing isn't new, wastewater disposal isn't new. What's what's changed? And the change is in drilling technology. So up to maybe 15 or 20 years ago, uh, oil and gas production wells were just vertical wells. And so this black area is our, is our area where we're going to be extracting oil and gas. Let's just imagine that you're producing a, a kiddie pool's worth of, of water that you need to dispose of. But now we're able to steer wells much better. And so you can, dr you can drill a, a horizontal well. And so what this means is that you can make a well that has a much lower ratio of oil to water. So you're producing much more water. We are able to make those wells economical when we could not make them vertically. And so what that means is we're going to be producing a lot more water. And so the average horizontal well produces 10 times more produced water than a old vertical well. And so that is really what has changed is that there's a lot more waste to be disposed of so that needs to go into more wells and they're often uh, much injected at much higher rate into these same wells so now that we've sort of gone through the the basics of, of what is actually happening i want to walk you through uh, a couple examples sort of the the two classic cases of of injection related induced seismicity and this goes back uh, to the early 1960s uh, outside of Denver, Colorado. And this is the first observation of injection-induced seismicity. Uh, the U.S. Army was producing chemical weapons on the Rocky Mountain Arsenal, and they had all these nasty chemicals that they needed to dispose of. So they drilled a deep well into the basement and started injecting fluids. And shortly thereafter, they, they started seeing earthquakes. And so you can see on the bottom is the, the fluid injection uh, Printed in millions of gallons. Apologies, this is just what comes from the paper, uh, and then shown in uh, red is the earthquakes. And so you can see that the earthquakes start happening a month or two after injection started. They actually turned off the well for about a year because they realized they were causing earthquakes. And you can see the seismicity slowed. They turned the well back on, and the seismicity. Uh, went back up. And so it was in late 1965 that they actually decided they had to stop this disposal program and the seismicity slowed rather quickly. Uh, this, the, the, this produced uh, an earthquake as large. The largest earthquake was a magnitude 4.9 that did cause a small amount of damage to some three-way overpasses. Um, and you can see this is a map view here. You can see there's seismicity up to three or four kilometers uh, away from the injection well. But if you look in depth, and so this is now a year after injection stopped. If you look in, in cross section here, you can see all the seismicity is five kilometers or more away from the injection well. And, and one additional thing that's really important to note here is that this magnitude 4.9 actually occurred after the injection had stopped a full year after the injection had stopped and so we need to know that just by stopping injection this doesn't eliminate the, the possibility of, of having future earthquakes because we've still modified the stress in the area so the next study that I that I wanted to talk about is what's known as the Rangeley experiment. And so this was led by Jack Healy, Barry Raleigh, and John Breedahoff, who's probably taking the, the photo here. Uh, and they were actually all at, at the USGS at my office uh, long before I was. And they um, managed to convince Chevron um to let them control part of one of their fields in Rangeley, California, uh, Rangeley, Colorado. And uh, Chevron had been having problems with induced seismicity. And so Jack Berry and, and John 
had the hypothesis that it was fluid pressure that was causing these earthquakes. And so they wanted to, to test if that was the case. And so the idea was, is they would inject as hard as they could and see what kind of earthquakes they produced. And then they'd flow back all of the wells to try to return the reservoir back to its natural state and see what the seismicity looked like uh, in that situation. And so the, the left hand uh, figure, so uh, the top one is a cross section, the bottom is map view, but let's just look at the, at the cross section. You can see this is a six month time window from 1972 to 1973. Uh, you can see that there's a cluster of seismicity right below the injection wells, and then a, a few kilometers away, there's more seismicity. And so for a six month time window, they produced a, a good amount of seismicity. And then for the following year, they flowed the wells back, returned it to its natural state, and nearly all of the seismicity went away. And so this is this was a really nice and clear demonstration uh, that it really does appear to be fluid pressure that is causing these earthquakes. Uh, so the last case study I want to talk about is actually a, a much more modern um, case study, but I think it's one of the, the nicest ones that I've seen. And this comes from Azle, Texas, which is near Dallas. And they had been experiencing uh, smaller earthquakes. They saw 27 magnitude 2 earthquakes in a, in a three month period, including a magnitude 3.6. And again, you know, this is occurring in an area that it is not accustomed to earthquakes. And so people got very upset. Um, and so that led to the USGS and, and colleagues putting out a seismic network to record the seismicity. And this this really this figure really demonstrates the, the problem with studying induced seismicity uh, in that it's generally occurring in places <coughs> that we don't actually have earthquakes. So we also don't have seismometers. So this is what the seismicity looked like. Uh, before the USGS put in a seismic network in the area. And this is what the seismicity looked like afterwards. So you can see that there's oops, there's a spread of, of the, the seismicity was spread over an area of, of 10 or 20 kilometers on a side. But once we had a good seismic network, you can actually see it's it's in an area of, of one or two kilometers. And so this is this is one of the things that that makes studying induced earthquakes very challenging. And so th this study uh, really went through all the possibilities of, of trying to understand what could cause these earthquakes. Were they natural? Uh, were these related to uh, water level changes in Eagle Mountain Lake? That's shown here. This is a reservoir uh, that was at, at particularly low levels. Uh, was it due to uh, decline in, in the water tape because uh, Texas had been experiencing a long drought? Uh, was it related to production because this is Texas and so there's oil and gas production or was it wastewater disposal? And so they, you know, this study really went through all of the, the different tests and they basically determined that the seismicity shown here uh, matches the area of highest stress associated with injection and production. And so. <coughs> This, this was just one of, one of the nicest studies that I've seen of this. So now I want to go through uh, just very briefly a couple of studies that instead of being case studies, they're, they're looking at, at induced seismicity in the United States in, in aggregate, trying to get at controls on uh, what kinds of parameters of a well make an earthquake more or less likely. And what you can see here on the left hand side is, is a plot of all the active saltwater disposal wells as of 2014. And then on the right is just the density of those wells. And we were trying to understand um, what is the connection between earthquakes. And so what was done is we basically said uh, for all of these dots are showing the location of injection wells. And the yellow ones are showing ones that had earthquakes within 10 kilometers of the injection well while the injection well was active. And we tried to say, what are the parameters of those wells that uh, made earthquakes more likely? And what we identified uh, using the sort of uh, 
national level study, we found that injection rates strongly controlled the likelihood of there being earthquakes and that higher earth injection rates made earthquakes more likely. And then an updated study by Scanlon and others uh, did it just for Oklahoma and Kansas, and they were able to identify that not only injection rate was important, but also the total volume injection and the proximity to basement were also very, very important in determining the probability of inducing an earthquake. And what I mean by proximity to basement is, is are you injecting in, into the sedimentary structures above the crystalline basement or are you injecting into basement? And as you get closer and closer, the likelihood of inducing earthquakes increases. Uh, one thing that, that was not found by, by either study is a connection between injection pressure and earthquakes. Um, it's, it's certainly possible that injection pressure is important but uh, injection pressures that are reported uh, for this, that, that were used by this study are, are notoriously unreliable. So we, we can't eliminate that, but it, it's, it, it's hard to say if the analysis is, is very helpful for that information. And obviously this sort of study, we really can't get at uh, whether or not that, what, what kind of geologic factors are also important because we know those have to be important as well. Um, so next, I, I want to briefly talk about some, some efforts that the USGS has done uh, from 2016 to 2018 to take our understanding of induced earthquakes to develop earthquake hazard models. And so earthquake hazard is, is the probability of damage or, or levels of shaking. And so this was, this was a, a very crude approach to it that was purely statistical but it did allow us to uh predict probabilities of of damage related to induced seismicity and you can see this figure is showing you where the the probability of, of damage was increased so oklahoma city dallas and again this raton basin area that you may remember and, and guy greenbrier for that individual year that this forecast was made and so if we just compare uh, to the hazard without induced earthquakes, you can see that the hazard in this part of the country is very, very low. But if you include hazard uh, from induced earthquakes, the hazard changes rather dramatically. And so uh, unfortunately, we've we've not continued making this product. Uh, and I think that there were some methodological concerns, but also the seismicity rate really dramatically dropped by the time we reached 2018. So as I, as I mentioned, this, this was a really crude approach to, to forecast induced seismicity or induced seismicity hazard. Uh, and so Jack Norbeck and I thought to ourselves, we've got to be able to develop a, a physical model to forecast induced seismicity. We know that the seismicity shown here in black tracks injection. Uh, we know depth to basement is important. We know injection rate is important. We know our fault geometry why can't we do better than a statistical model? Well, <coughs> we don't actually really know our fault geometry. All of these colors show you earthquake locations from Oklahoma and shown in black are the locations of faults. And you can see are the locations of faults from that fault map I showed you earlier. And you could see almost none of the seismicity lies on those faults. So we don't actually know where the faults are. And so Putting in putting in an incredibly complex uh, model didn't make any sense. So so Jack and I decided to do something very simple. And we said, what do we know about? Well, we know about our geology. We know about our rocks. We know about the injection. So let's do something simple. And we developed a model where we uh, forecast the fluid pressurization rate. And from the fluid pressurization rate and a rate and state uh, friction earthquake uh, nucleation model, we're able to generate earthquake rate forecasts. And this is the output from that. So here shown in blue is the injection rate for the this Oklahoma area of interest. So where the seismicity is occurring. Shown in this blue histogram is the observed seismicity rate. And shown in red is our forecast. And you can see we're doing a, a remarkably good job. You can see that we hit the onset, the peak, and the decline in the seismicity. And this is only using 
basically a six parameter model. So I think I think we're doing a, a pretty darn good job with this this simple of a model. And there are a number of other models uh, that have developed been developed out there. Langenbrook and others have developed a, a hydrological model that's been coupled with an empirical seismicity model. Jai and others uh, used a hydromechanical and poroelastic model coupled with a rate and state model like like what uh, Norbeck and Rubenstein did. Uh, that they've developed, and Dempsey and Ruffo developed a hydromechanical model that's coupled with rate and state. So there's a, there's a number of different flavors out there of, of ways to do this. Um, and I should say we've, we've also developed a method to actually port the earthquake rate forecasts into hazard. And in general, um, the USGS thinks in more of a hazard perspective because our users are really going to be people that that uh, are interested in probabilities of shaking, uh, say say for engineers or insurance companies, uh, people like that. They they want to know probability of shaking as opposed to probability of an individual earthquake. So I last want to touch on on a couple topics that I I think are sort of really ripe for for future uh, exploration. Um, and 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 areas that that are still uh, rather poorly understood. So some 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 things that I think are are most exciting and in, in where the the science is going. And and one of them is is long range triggering. And so here's a map of uh, the state of Kansas, uh, and you can see here's 37 degrees, 38 degrees. So this is about 100, 115 kilometers between these two. And so the, the state is you know, 300, 350 kilometers north to south. So it's, it's a decent sized place. And what you can see shown here in red is, is recent seismicity and then shown in blue is historical seismicity. And so you can see that there is a, a scattering of seismicity that's spread across the state. And you can see that this, there's this big cluster of seismicity at the southern end of the state, and that's related to the same sort of processes that we've seen in Oklahoma. But we've also got these clusters of seismicity in all of these different areas um, where there, you're not near Oklahoma, you don't have massive injection. So what is actually happening in these locations? And all of these areas that are labeled have had magnitude four or larger earthquakes in the past five years. And so here we've plotted the total injected fluid volume and the location of, of these areas where there have been magnitude fours. And you can see all of them with the exception of this, this seismicity near Plainville are occurring in areas without significant uh, amounts of fluid injection. And so we now have to try to rectify our understanding is how are we getting these earthquakes in places where there isn't much fluid ejection? How, you know, are the, are the fluid pressures really being transmitted that far? And observations are, are starting to tell us yes. Uh, so, so two different studies by, by colleagues at, at the Kansas Geological Survey and the University of Kansas uh, of, of some observation wells have shown that fluid pressures are transferred uh, at significant distances. This Ansari paper, um, you can see that here's the, here's the fluid pressure. This is a, these are four different injection wells or four different observation wells. You can see from the early 90s till uh, the, the mid 2000s, injection the fluid pressures were relatively stable and they just started ramping up dramatically uh, in the late 2000s. And um, this uh, this red station here is about 25 kilometers away from where any significant injection is occurring. And so they're seeing pressure changes up to 25 kilometers. And so this is this is showing us that this fluid pressure, these fluid pressure changes based on these observations are being transferred uh, very, very far distances. And uh, the, the Petery work actually is, is arguing for triggering up to 90 kilometers, and they're making an argument for fluid pressure changes on the order of uh, about a tenth of a tenth of a megapascal at those sorts of distances which is certainly large enough to be inducing an earthquake. So 
this is this is really we're going to people are really starting to to rethink this whole situation in that in these areas fluid pressures can be transmitted at very long distances rapidly um so so how do we deal with with managing that sort of thing and so so the last sort of interesting and exciting thing that, that i wanted to bring up is a seismic slip and induce seismicity. Uh, so traditionally, we've thought of two different models, and so this is primarily built on the work of AIR and others. So traditionally, we've thought of induced seismicity in, in, in one of, of two models, uh, where the, you've got increased pore pressure on the fault and that causes slip, and that's really uh, what I alluded to before. Uh, or you can have a change of fault loading conditions. So this is going to be your, your pore elastic stresses uh, causing uh, slip on a fault down here. But people are starting to be able to find evidence that this fluid injection can cause a seismic slip and sometimes just a seismic slip or then a seismic slip that subsequently causes earthquakes. And so this is a new wrinkle. And I think this is going to be interesting both from an induced seismicity perspective, but also just for a, a seismogenesis and for natural earthquakes perspective as well. So we can see there's some really nice results by Eve Guglielmi and colleagues that they published a number of years ago where they actually uh, have a sort of 10 meter scale experiment where they were able to inject into a fault and they were actually, they didn't know what they were going to get but they actually observed uh, slow slip in the area. And so this is this is a, a complicated plot. So with, so with my apologies, um, let's just first focus on this uh, injection rate shown here in green. You can see it's sort of rapid, sort of ramping up and reaches sort of a steady state here. Uh, but what's really important are these uh, black lines here. And so uh, the solid line is displacement, the dashed line is false fault opening. And so we're measuring displacement on this fault. And you can see at this time S0, we're already starting to see some slip on this fault. The fault has already been opening. And so this is undoubtedly due to the rising fluid pressure within this fault. But down here, we haven't seen any seismicity at all. Yet we have very clearly seen, you know, two tenths of a millimeter of, of uh, slip on this fault before we actually see our first earthquake. And so this is really showing us that, that we're seeing slow slip that's occurring. Uh, we're seeing slip that's occurring aseismically prior to fault slip in this area. And so this, this figure also really nicely shows this in that your radius of your pressurized zone based on observations, again, is more or less constant at around 10 meters or so. But the radius of the slip zone is actually increasing and it, incre it increases sort of through this entire aseismic period before it actually reaches. And so it's already outside. The, the aseismic slip zone is already outside the area of increased fluid pressure by the time that seismicity begins in this area. And the the other one other observation of, of a seismic slip that I found particularly convincing is, is from uh, central Alberta in Canada, uh, which is some uh, hydraulic fracturing induced seismicity. Uh, and they're injecting into the Duvernay formation. We're in cross section here and they've sort of modeled the Pore pressure uh, field is sort of in this area here. Oops. And they start seeing creep across this area. And subsequently, you start seeing seismicity in a much larger region. And so basically what they see is that there's about five hours of creep before this magnitude four actually occurs. And so this is showing us, again, another nice observation of a seismic slip to some degree enabling a earthquake to occur. And so the last observation of uh, a seismic slip and, and induced seismicity actually comes from uh, a geothermal field. Um, this is outside of the Borali seismic zone in, in Southern California. And this is some work done by Catherine Materno, published, uh, I think, just 
uh, a month or two ago, actually. And she was studying, there was a magnitude six earthquake. We're looking at cross section here. She is studying a magnitude six earthquake that was believed to be related to um, geothermal production in the area. And her work, she was actually able to identify this area of pre-seismic slip. And this was all a seismic slip. And so again, instead of sort of these very short time period a seismic slips that we saw in the previous two studies, here we're seeing a, an area that has a seismic slip for three years prior to the occurrence of this slip. And this, this uh, area of a seismic slip actually released nearly two times as much uh, moment as did the actual earthquake. And so again, this is really showing us that, that uh, seismic slip earthquakes are only part of the issue when it comes to sort of induced seismicity and, and understanding the response to human activities. So I'm just going to wrap up with a bit of a summary and sort of our, our outlook going forward. Uh, as I've mentioned, we've seen, seen a real global rise in induced seismicity. The, the areas that have probably grabbed the most news would be the Sichuan Basin in China. They've experienced multiple magnitude fives, a lot of magnitude fours, and, and fatalities in at least two different earthquakes. Um, and and uh, to my knowledge, uh, oil and gas production is, continues apace. And um, the, these are, are very important, both uh, societally and scientifically. Uh, British Columbia and Alberta uh, are also seeing, have seen dramatic rises in induced seismicity. They're actually an area where uh, regulation is taken very seriously and they have both been able to reasonably well mitigate seismicity. And uh, here in the United States where I am, We've seen dramatic rises in, in Oklahoma and then the subsequent crash in seismicity. The earthquake rate has dropped by over 96% in the past five years. And now subsequently the rise of seismicity in the Permian Basin in, in West Texas and uh, Southeastern New Mexico. So we've got a number of different areas uh, that, that are really seeing this intense increase in seismicity. From a mitigation perspective, I, I think I think things are a little bit murky. Uh, we've seen mitigation uh, become very effective. And I mean, you just need to look at, at the Rangeley experiment that I showed you earlier, where they were able to basically turn off the earthquakes by returning the, the region back to its natural state. Uh, but that's, that's not really uh, something that, that you can manageably do in, in an area of oil and gas. Uh, production is really returning it back to its, its natural state. And, and if you look at Rocky Mountain Arsenal, uh, we actually saw earthquakes there over a decade after they stopped injecting. Um, so, so seismicity can persist for a very long time, but it's, 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 it's not all bad. It's not all bad. We've seen in Oklahoma, the earthquake rate has dropped by 96%. And that is largely, it's, it's a combination of both economic factors and regulations that have taken place uh, requiring lowered injection rates. Um, so, so the mitigation strategies have worked there. There was also a Finnish geothermal project uh, in Helsinki that, that that I did not talk about, but uh, this this was a project just to develop heat for a university campus, uh, and they had a very specific set of protocols on how to manage induced seismicity, and they were able to manage the induced seismicity very well and did not uh, have any significant earthquakes as a result of it. And so I think that that was is a really encouraging result where um, people have been been able to show that carefully managed induced seismicity can be mitigated. And, and lastly, what are what are areas for growth? What are areas for concern? I think um, fundamentally we we really need to improve our ability to forecast earthquakes and improve our ability to sort of understand uh, what are the characteristics of wells and what are the characteristics of geology and operations that make earthquakes more and less likely and how can we adjust oil and gas operations to, to make things uh, safer. I think uh, from a scientific perspective, understanding long range triggering at great distances 
is is also really important. Um, and lastly, you know, something something that I think really needs to be thought about, and I really didn't really touch on this in this talk, is is that geothermal energy uh, and carbon sequestration are are both coming online rather rapidly, and these are both uh, technologies that rely heavily on fluid injection and have already produced uh, induced seismicity. And so um, even, even if we rapidly uh, move away from, from an oil and gas uh, energy system, uh, fluid injection, underground fluid injection is not going to go away. So, so injection related induced seismicity will, will still need to be considered going forward. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, leave it there and I'll be happy to Take questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Justin, uh, for your brilliant talk. Uh, you have beautifully described the evolution of our knowledge uh, on induced seismicity, the mechanism of fluid injection that can induce uh, earthquakes, and finally, different mathematical and statistical methods uh, to forecast induced earthquakes. Thanks once again for your lucid presentation. We appreciate it. Now, the forum is open for interactions. Uh, I request the participant to raise their hands to ask their questions. Uh, in the meantime, we can uh, take uh, the remarks from the honorable guest present today. So first, I'd like to request uh, the session chairperson, Professor J.R. Kyle, for his remarks. Over to Professor J.R. Kyle. At the outset, hearty congratulations to Dr. Wilstein. It was amazing information and really was so educative. Yeah. Given us a big account of the induced seismicity around the world and due to oil production and, and fracturing and hydrofracturing. I have I have little uh, I might have missed you. I have a small query that uh, in Oklahoma in 2016 uh, you had experienced three earthquakes or minute five. 5.1, 5.3, like that. Is it due to EOR, due to uh, injection, due to early recovery of oil, or what was the main cause for such earthquake? The, the, those earthquakes were, were related to saltwater disposal, and that's, that's really what we think is responsible for nearly all of the uh, seismicity in in the United States, uh, we have seen frac related seismicity uh, in, in all of these areas, but for some reason, uh, frac related seismicity in the U.S. seems to be smaller than it is, say, in Canada or in China. The biggest frac related earthquake we've seen uh, is about a magnitude four or so. Um, but you know, as as I sort of showed with that thought experiment, it does make sense that, that we would be seeing bigger earthquakes related to, to wastewater disposal. And it's just the incredible amount of water that they're putting underground there. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay. I think it was it was a wonderful uh, wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you so much again. Uh, really uh, for educating us to such a huge data set and huge examples of different kinds of, you know, Hindu scientists. Thank you so much. Over to Thank Dr. Khan. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, now we have with us uh, Dr. Opi Misra, Honorable Director of National Center for Seismology, Government of India. I may request Dr. Misra uh, for his remarks. About Dr. Misra. Maybe he's uh, offline. Uh, we, we, have, we have also Dr. Sumay Supra, Director of uh, Institute of Seismological Research, Gujarat. So may I request Dr. Supra, sir, for his uh, remarks. Over to Dr. Supra. Uh, good morning to all. I, I think, uh, and uh, with this to Dr. Justin, this was very nicely presented about the induced seismicity. Actually, we are also living in uh, Gujarat, which is an intra plate region. Uh, stable considered as a stable continental region but we have a lot of earthquake activity and uh, there is one uh, particular region in uh, Gujarat. It, it is a host type of structure in Saurashtra where we are getting a lot of monsoon induced seismicity means after heavy rainfall 
every year we are getting lot of hundreds of earthquakes swam type of earthquakes and the maximum magnitude which we have recorded uh, till date is of uh, 5.1 magnitude and in 2007 and 2011 but my uh, main issue is how to account this type of activity in our hazard maps means uh, mainly probabilistic hazard maps how to account for this <laughs> so that is an issue that's, that, that's a that's a hard question <laughs> Uh, yeah, that, that's 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 a really interesting observation. I I wasn't aware of of rainfall related earthquakes that were that big. I'm, I I'd love I'd love to catch up offline about that. Um, you know, I, off off the cuff, I I couldn't really give you a, a lot of good advice except maybe to to look at things statistically. I mean, given given that there's you know no real human influence on this. Uh, on the rainfall, well, aside from obvious climate change related issues, um, you know, I, I think you could effectively treat it as as natural per se, and just in your in your sort of stand in the standard way that you account for natural seismicity as sort of it, it would be part of your background rate if, if you're looking for a, a probabilistic hazard forecast. Thank you, Justin. I think okay. I, you have answered the queries uh, of Dr. Supra. Uh, we have uh, with us uh, Dr. Uit Suranju, uh, uh, University of Gadamada, uh, Indonesia. He is also the session's co chairperson. I request Dr. Suranju uh, for his uh, remarks. Short okay. remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Santanu. Uh, good morning, uh, Justin. Thank you very much uh, for sharing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, quite uh, interesting uh, topic, a yeah. uh, lot of data and also experience, but still um, uh, a lot of things that we do not know exactly about uh, what, what's going on uh, during the process. Uh, and I, I, I just wonder uh, when you're showing uh, in trying to to statistically uh, uh, model uh, the induced seismicity, uh, you show that uh, the the fault uh, from a geology, uh, the fault location is, is in some some cases it's not uh, related with the uh, the the hypocenter of the earthquake. So you say that we, we don't know the fault actually where is it located. Do you do you <laughs> can explain more about uh, the situation, please? Sure, that's, that's that's a great question. That's a great question. So so we have these you know incredibly detailed fault maps of Oklahoma, for example, just because you know this has been an area of, of oil and gas exploitation since the 1800s, and you know there, a lot of sort of the seismic exploration techniques were invented there, and so there are these incredible maps of the faults, but most of the seismicity that's that's occurring in Oklahoma is occurring on stripe slip faults. You know the the, the faults and yeah. but the faults that you're going to be imaging. With with 3D seismic and things like that, they aren't going to pick up strike slip faults very well. You know, you're really able to detect a, a fault using 3D imaging because that's how they're seeing them. Is if there's some vertical throw on the fault because you'll see a different a velocity contrast. If you've just got a horizontal fault and you haven't, you don't actually have any relative change in in the strata that are next to each other it won't actually really show up on the 3d seismic and so that's that's really the problem obviously you know the the, the faults that these earthquakes are occurring on are are real and they exist <laughs> but you just you can't see them with with the tools that the oil and gas industry was using okay yeah so we have also the same case uh even this is a uh, quite a uh, big earthquake 6.3 and this is a strike slip fault, but when we monitor the aftershocks, the location of the aftershock distribution is about 10 kilometers far from the geological fault itself. So although we can model that it's a bit uh, uh, a thrust fault, so it's an angle, a small angle uh, of the slip, but yeah, we still think that it's uh, perhaps to the difference between uh, the geological in the uh, site uh, 
it didn't settle. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that that certainly sounds like a possibility or, you know, we we often wind up with sort of distributed fault zones. Yes. Yes. You know, I think you know. In, in, you know, I live in California, so I think about the San Andreas Fault. <laughs> yeah. you know, we we we, th- we we think of it as as yeah. you know as as one real linear feature. But yeah. if you think in Southern California, you know, the plate boundary is really made up yeah. of of the San Andreas system. So there's the San Andreas Fault, there's the San Jacinto Fault, there's the El Cerro Fault, and that spans a much larger region. Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's the sort of thing that that's happening yeah. there. <laughs> okay, Justin, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Hopefully, uh, we can uh, meet each other next time. Thank you, Sandana. Yeah. Thank you very uh, Justin, can you take two more questions? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Himangsu, uh, I think from NGO, right? Please unmute yourself and ask your question. <coughs> hi, hi, Dr. Justin. Uh, uh, if you can uh, hear me, yeah. So I yep. just <clears throat> so my question is uh, a little bit uh, away from what you have already told. So you have told about mostly induced seismicity related to gas industry or industry. But what we see, uh, this, um, if you see a, a, uh, for the recent few years or maybe the decade, we are seeing lots of monsoon induced seismicity, um, especially in India. So my question is uh, how much. Uh, do you uh, how much do we understand about monsoon induced seismicity? Are they very commonplace or they are not so uh, uh, studied? Yeah, that's my question. I, 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 to, to be perfectly honest, I'm not I'm not very knowledgeable about the topic. Um, I I would I would really love love to learn more. It's not it's it, you know I I we've. My group, we're really we're really focused on on human induced seismicity, um, but there's you know I, I could certainly you know that I've certainly seen observations of of slow slip in Hawaii induced by rainfall events. So rainfall events similar to a monsoon, but I yeah I don't I don't know much, I, but I would love to learn more. Yeah, sorry sorry I don't have a better answer. Yeah, no no it's okay. But what I wanted to know is that. We should expect a similar behavior from rain induced seismicity as well, right? I will. It. I mean, it'll be. A, it, it'll be a little more complicated. Uh, yeah, it would be a little more complicated just because, uh, in general, when when we think of, of fluid induced seismicity, we think of the the fluids actually getting into the faults. Now, what, what I just just recalled is there was some work done by. Oh, I want to say it was Lynn Sykes, but I, I could be misremembering from the mid 2000s where they were looking at typhoon related seismicity in Taiwan. And what they were actually able to show is that it was it was not related to the actual rainfall, but it was related to the drop in the atmospheric pressure. So that that might be something worth looking into is the relationship between atmospheric pressure and um, and the seismicity. But you know this is this is this is a really fascinating topic. I would I would I would love to learn more about it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for your tips. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. The last question from uh, Mr. Sitaranjan from BZRL. Mr. Sitaranjan, please unmute yourself. Yes, yes sir. Uh, I, I please be loud. Please say loudly. Yes, sir. Audible now? Yes, yes. Yeah, sir. I having one two uh, queries here. Uh, sir, uh, as uh, uh, the Oklahoma, Oklahoma the region, we are having. Uh, you have told that uh, we are having also seismic uh, that slip contribution in this also the seismicity, and that is characterized by uh, that uh, larger uh, larger seismic moment. So, what may be the reasons uh, that causing the larger seismic moments? So I'm not quite sure. Can are you asking what is causing the largest earthquakes? Is that the question? Yeah, yeah the larger seismic moment uh, that is uh, uh, that uh, uh, that earthquake that is caused by the uh, seismic slip. By by a seismic slip. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh well. The, so the the largest um, a seismic slip related to induced seismicity that that we know of. Um, would would probably actually be uh, that 
that example I showed you at the, at the very end uh, from Southern California, the, the geothermal related seismicity, where you saw it was a magnitude six earthquake, but there was actually more a seismic slip just adjacent to it. So that would probably be equivalent to a magnitude 6.1 or 6.2, but you know, it's it's hard it's hard to say uh, just because you know this this is the best observation we have. That doesn't mean that there isn't anything there. Uh, you really would have to be looking for it with geodetic methods to do that. And I think in, in a lot of these areas, uh, you know, there there isn't the GPS coverage, and now there there is fortunately now the INSAR coverage, but people would actually have to be looking for it, and that may or may not happen. Okay, sir. Uh, the another query is with you, sir, uh, that uh, uh, the many articles I've seen uh, in this uh, that Oklahoma and Fairview sequence here, that uh, some uh, uh, the authors uh, tell that the those into the aquifers get to the lowest drop, and another contrary observation is also there, that is uh, uh, the another author reported that the low uh, uh, that is the of is may reduce artifact of its composition as well. So they are having contradiction that uh, the indeed uh, artifact is characterized by low stress drop and the natural artifact is characterized by high stress drop. So what is actually view of this? So you're asking why why do I think sometimes we have low stress, you know, do we have a seismic slip and sometimes we have seismic slip, which is going to be higher stress drop? Is that, uh, is that uh, the? Uh, no, 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 sir. The can do that the sensitivity is taking a low uh, stress drop here this, uh, on the region uh, that some authors reported here. And also some other reported that, uh, that, uh, uh, that, uh, Low stress drop is architect due to the compression, etc. So the stress drop, drop should not be actually different from this natural success. So what is the actually view of this? I, 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 I'm not sure if I fully follow the question, but fundamentally, I think we've seen observations of stress drop really kind of all over the place for induced seismicity. Um, we've seen areas where, where people say there is very high stress drop. There's people areas where people see very low stress drop. And, you know, if you look at these areas where I pointed out that there's a seismic slip, that's incredibly low stress drop slip. So, and, and fundamentally, um, you know, I, I, I am in general very skeptical of stress drop measurements, I think. Oftentimes they're reliable within an individual method applied to an individual location, but comparing you know, Oklahoma to Nevada, to Texas, to India is not really a, a, a safe thing to do. So I, I, I would be reticent to really draw meaning from any one area having higher or lower stress drops than another. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Justin. Uh, so we have reached the last part of today's session. That is good of thanks. I may request Dr. Manoj Fukam, uh, the principal scientist at CSNS Zurat, to propose a vote of thanks. Over to Dr. Fukam. Hello. Uh, good morning uh, to all the Indian participants and good day to the rest of the participants from the rest of the world. As uh, the session comes to an end, I really feel privileged to offer our vote of thanks for a very exciting technical session on the ninth day of IPWGSD 2022. At the very outset, uh, on behalf of the organizing committee and on my personal behalf, I offer our sincere thanks to Dr. Justin Rubain, United States Geological Survey, for readily accepting our honorable, uh, humble invitation and for delivering such a highly educative talk uh, on induced seismicity. And I think we really learned a lot. Uh, thank you, Dr. Justin. Uh, we are grateful to our director, uh, Professor Jian Sastri, uh, for all his encouragement and guidance towards organizing the event. We heartily thank our international advisors Dr. Andrew J. Michael, USGS, Professor Tapeng Zhao, Toko University, and Professor Alan L. Kafka, Boston College, USA, for guiding us through this event. 
our special thanks goes to our guide, Professor J.L. Kyle, the ex deputy director general of GSI, and also the chairperson of this session for his consistent support and involvement in organizing the workshop. Our gratitude goes to Stephen Coop, the person that we would Indonesia and Dr. Debozit Hazirika, Wadia Institute of Himalayan Geology for, all, for their all out support. We are really grateful to the special guest of today's session, Dr. O. P. Misra, Director NCS India, Dr. Sukanto Roy, Director BGRL, Minister of uh, Arts Science India, Dr. Sumesh Chopra, Director ISR Gujarat, and Dr. Abhijit Goes, University of California, USA, for their presence and making the event even more interactive. I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Santonu Burua, convener of this workshop, for taking the pain in organizing the workshop for three consecutive years. Our sincere gratitude goes to all the members of the technical committee who have rendered untiring efforts in uninterrupted organization of the event. Last but not the least, I on behalf of the organizing committee offer our profound gratefulness to all the mom attendees for your active participation in the session. We also expect similar response from you for our next technical session tomorrow, that is 29 September 2022, served at 10 a.m. IST. The keynote speaker for the tomorrow session is Professor Wiwit Triantu, Gajamazar University, Indonesia. And he will deliver his talk on an excited, excited topic and entitled Crustal and Acetropy of Sumatra from Harmonic Decomposition of an of Receiver Function. With this, we come to the end of today's session. Thank you and wish you all a very good day. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Justin. Thank Thanks you, guys. Good night. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Justin. Thank you very much. Good night. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Samana. Thank you, Mr. Stein. Thank you. You made it really yeah. enlightened yeah. us. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> very, very, very nice. Very nice, sir. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, guys.